I heard something yesterday about the fact there's some percentage of all of our economic activity is retail activity. And I, what is that percentage in the U.S. economy? It's one out of every twelve dollars <coughs> goes through Walmart, and I mean, it's yes. huge, huge numbers. What we know is uh, about seventy percent of our total GDP is consumer spending. Okay, seventy percent. And the, the comment was that because people now are really concerned, they're buying guns, they're buying <laughs> bottled water, they're not going to spend much at Christmas, that kind of thing, that this is going to just exacerbate the problem we're in even more because people are out there uh, shopping and doing things that retailers need to keep their businesses afloat. So do you see this, the, the negative news precipitating even a a, a worsening recession. Well, oh, of there course. Could be, could of course. A, could I use the D word? I mean, is this, or is this the makings of a depression? No. Okay. No, I don't see that at all. The Great Depression occurred uh, before the Federal Reserve really was a strong factor in our economy. In the 1930s, the feeling was we should not intervene, let the weak companies go under. That's the correct thing to do. So we had a hands off approach, and we see how well that worked. Right? And we created the Great Depression with one stupid thing after another. Um, for example, the Federal Reserve took money out of the economy. The worst, the worst experience the Federal Reserve has ever uh, had. They, there have been a lot of books by ex-governors of the Fed that say, you know, we're really embarrassed about that. It was a bad mistake. So in a way, the Fed created the Great Depression by taking money away, just as if I reached into your wallet right now and took all your cash. You'd say, uh-oh, I've got to cut back a little bit. I don't have the cash anymore. Um, we put a tariff on all imported goods coming into the U.S. because we were concerned about unfair competition. The whole world responded and did the same. World trade ground to a halt. That knocked GDP off. That created a Great Depression. We. Um, So many people lost everything they had from bank failures and company bankruptcies. We said, well, let's fix that. Let's create Social Security in the 1930s. How's that funded? With a tax? This is ludicrous. Slap a tax on a weak economy? I know the intent was there to help, sure. But a tax on a weak economy? Anyway, it was mistake after mistake after mistake. We have a much more active Fed, a much, much more active governor, a government, a different attitude about letting companies fail. Uh, there's no way we're going to have a Great Depression. I certainly don't think so anyway. I think we'll, at worst, have a rip-snorting recession. We've survived those like we did in the early 80s. It can happen. We'll survive. You didn't say anything about student loans. What do you see as the future? Which I, uh, could affect uh, some people in this room if there's even one or two years of you know a big reduction in student loans. I don't know what's going to happen, but I think no matter who the candidate is, both uh, Senators Obama and McCain have said we're going to change the student loan program one way. I think their hand is forced now uh, after taking office. They're going to have to pump some money in. I don't think they have a choice. I also don't think they have a choice. There are not going to be any tax increases. There can't be. Any, any time either candidate says, well, we're going to increase the tax here. No, they're not. No, they're not. You can't do that in a weak economy. We know we can't. That will not happen. So when you're watching the candidates debate each other or run their political ads, there aren't going to be any increased taxes. It's hot air now. It's too late. Can't do it. Too weak. They know better. They'll never make it through Congress. And if it did, we'd impeach them all and put in our people that would say, eh, OK, let's fix this now. No more tax increases. The best thing we do is cut taxes. We talked about the presidents at the Howland Stein Center, and you're moving into that territory. What can the president do, in effect, or what should the president do that's within his constitutional duties to uh, steer a responsible course through this difficult recession? I think a president can lead his party, with coordinated effort, and say, look, here's what I want to get done, get the support of his party. Maybe that can make it through Congress. I know just in my lifetime, if something doesn't get done the first year, it's probably not going to get done. The odds will go way down. 
and the first year we're going to be in a recession. So I would think the president's biggest impact could be cutting taxes, shoring up the student loan program, things to stimulate the economy. I'm not sure what all there is, but that will be the issue next year. Whoever wins, it's next year. They're going to have to do something. Their hand will be forced. And I think the whole next year will be spent on uh, economic stimulation. Well, we were read again about $4 trillion worth of economic stimulation just recently. You want more of it? Yes, I do. Let, let's make sure that the microphone picked that up. Four Trillion. Four trillion dollars of economic stimulation over in the last six years. The last six years. Well, the total output, GDP, gross domestic product, that's the selling price of all final goods and services in the U.S. is 14.3 trillion. So, spending a trillion a year to goose up the economy, we can handle that. Our our federal debt levels are quite reasonable, especially compared with the rest of the world. But the economy just lost 1.4 trillion. Somewhere. And we'll lose <laughs> another trillion or two, perhaps. Pro probably. But the debt doesn't go down. It stays at 11 trillion or whatever it is. So we can still do it. We can push that debt into the future forever, if that's our wish. I'll use the example. Uh, my parents, back when they were in the prime of their careers, they borrowed money to finance World War II. I'm happy about that. I don't think I could have learned German. I'm glad I was born in the U.S. I'm glad we won the war. And any debt they incurred and passed to me, I wasn't foolish enough to pay off. I added to it. So did you. And we'll push it on to our children and grandchildren. And unless we are raising a generation or two of idiots, they won't pay it off either. They'll keep it going into the future. That can go on indefinitely until the world loses its confidence in the U.S. and quits buying federal securities. And I don't think we're in any danger of that. So, and also, also, if we have 4% inflation, 4% of our government debt's wiped out. So it goes away all by itself. Inflation goes away, destroys the debt. Would you explain that, please, for the neophyte? <laughs> well, okay. uh, look at this example. My grandfather built his house way back in the teens, 19s, whatever, for a little more than $1,000. Let's suppose back then he would have borrowed the whole $1,000. I don't know if he did or not, probably not, but let's suppose he did. And decades later, if he would have come to me and said, Greg, you can have my house but you also get the $1,000 of debt. I would have said, this is my happiest day, Grandpa. You're giving me a $100,000 house for $1,000. I'd have jumped right on that because $1,000 is nothing to me because of inflation over the decades. To him, it was his whole house. To him, it was a monster piece of debt. So inflation destroys the value of debt. 5% inflation wipes out 5% of our national debt. So I don't think the correct focus is, well, we're incurring money to bail us out. We want to get bailed out. We want the government to be proactive, not in a silly way, but do it correctly. Loan money to the auto companies and do it quickly. They might not be around in two months. Do it quickly. <laughs>